Testing. Yep. I don't need the PC for my talk, but um, if the next guy, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Very good. Is it okay now? Yep. Hello. Um, we seem to be having some uh, display issues, but uh, my talk doesn't require any sort of display, so I'm just going to give mine, and I think we might have to call it quits after that, given that we can't seem to get a laptop to work with the display anymore. Um, so I just wanted to talk about uh, pain for Linux in that uh, it's all the machine, all the laptops I've bought in the past, I've not been able to buy without Windows installed. It's always been a bit of a pet peeve of mine, and I'm sure quite a few of you. Uh, but um, I know Dell now sell a Linux, uh, a laptop with Linux, but it's not really available in Australia. And even if you are to buy it from the Dell website in America, uh, it's not under the net, their main sort of sales thing. It's buried under some page deep in the recesses, and if you don't know the link, you don't get offered it. Uh, there is a couple of uh, companies that specialize in, lit in uh, laptops for Linux, such as uh, System76 in America and Zareason. So those two sites will sell you a Linux laptop that is certified and uh, tested for Linux, and they test the new Ubuntu or whatever uh, when it comes out to make sure it continues it, so you actually get proper support for Linux. But uh, recently I also came across another place in Australia that um, there's a place called uh, Logic Logic One. Hold on a second. I always forget the name of this place. <laughs> that better? <laughs> uh, where'd it go? And now it's going to take time. I forgot the name of the. <laughs> I looked at it before, so I was going to remember it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's uh, called logicalblue1.com.au, and they sell a number of different, uh, they're resellers basically of a number of different types of laptops, and one of the laptops, or one of the, the models they carry is called a Horizon Clio, Cle uh, Clevo, and um, those machines come by default with what Windows or Linux or nothing. Uh, so. A lot of the time when you get offered uh, a Linux laptop, you actually start doing the, you know, I want Windows or not Windows. You find that the price is actually the same. So even if you're not, want, if, even if you don't, if you, even if you say you don't want Windows, you're still paying the same cost, which means you're actually still paying for the Windows license. They're just not putting it on there for you. Yep. Yep. Uh, they probably won Chrome OS. Uh, I would imagine you could. I'm pretty sure Google packages to make sure all the drivers and stuff um, in the Linux. Um, yeah, I, was, I, I know the Chrome OS, OS is Linux in its in its core, uh, but you know whether you actually whether they make it open enough for you to get in and put your own on there is a different matter. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I thought they might have something like that. Yeah. 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 
lot of stuff in there that says that the bar is all the same size and held and the layers are the same size. Did you get to pull the arm ones as well? The arms do run clones. Uh, I don't know if, if that particular one runs uh, run, uh, run, run for boot. Uh, but yeah, the arm arm for it that has been primary for it. Anyway, um, yeah, so this logical blue one, you actually say I don't want Windows and the price is actually cheaper. So that to me says that you're not actually paying for a Windows license, which is what I'm basically looking for <laughs> in a laptop if I ever buy a laptop again. Um, <coughs> so that's what I basically wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is that I think it's important for us to if we want to support the tools that we use to donate a little bit to whatever tool we're using and I've s decided that from now on I'm going to you know set aside you know 20 30 dollars a month or whatever to donate to whatever projects I'm using uh, such as you know Wikipedia or whatever and I think I'd like to encourage anybody else to do the same and if you set aside 30 bucks a month and every month you donate it to whatever project you happen to be interested in that month, I think it'll go a long way. If, if a large number of us do that, it'll go a long way to keep these projects going. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, now, since we couldn't get a laptop displaying and our other two talks, I think, uh, what was the other talk? Uh, did you need a laptop? You got that one? Shall we try that one? See if it goes. You want to? Uh, wrong type. Okay. There's this one. <laughs> Is that coming through, Tim? <laughs> Do we have a VGA one? Uh, where did that other little here? This little dongle. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm so ashamed bringing my Mac and look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. At least it's not Windows. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, see if you can get a uh, the monitor set up. Up. Um, running out of battery. There's, I don't think there's a charger. Uh, there was. It was? Oh. Fantastic. <laughs> Is it going? 
It doesn't seem to be plugged in. It's a white, it's the only white cable. It's coming down. Hmm? It's plugged? Yeah, it's plugged in there. I'll just see if you can get away with it. Just give you a talk and see how far you get. Ha, ah, there we go.
Okay. Yep. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Lightning talks. <laughs> um, my name is Ziggy, and I've been using Gen two. Linux for many years. I noticed that it's not particularly popular um, and uh, sufficiently well known as it has so much um, interest, particularly for developers and system administrators, people like us who are um, enthusiasts of Linux, not just using it um, um, be, um, just to try it. Uh, like it happens with many people that go into Ubuntu or in the enterprise that uh, they try to go with um, um, a Red Hat or SUSE because they have an enterprise uh, um, set of services um, or uh, Novell, Oracle. Um, Gen2 is um, unlike most distributions, is referred to as a meta distribution um, because it is not um, delivered in any particular format. It's um, um, it's a loosely compiled um, a group of packages, and there is a very uh, small uh, core distribution, which is what is normally are distributed is the bootstrap to, to get started with. Um, there is also a live distribution with a DVD with graphical um, uh, interface. Um, but most Gen2 users begin um, just by trying the distribution from, from the, the, the smallest um, of its characteristics. Um, in the Gen2 website, the in the about, there is this funny uh, screen uh, that tells the story of uh, Gen2. So Larry the cow was a bit frustrated at the current state of Linux distributions. So the latest, latest distros seem to be just a bunch of the same old stuff, nothing new, nothing innovative. Then Larry tried Gen2 Linux. He was impressed. He found a BSD-style port system with a bunch of advanced features. He discovered lots of up-to-date packages that could be auto-built using the optimization settings and build-time functionality that he wanted, rather than what some distro created thought would be best for him. All of a sudden, Larry the cow was in control, and he liked it. And this is basically the... Um, at least for me, it has been for, for all these years. I've been using Gen2 for about um, 10 years now. And being in control has been my, um, the, the, uh, my main drive for, for using Gen2. Gen2 sometimes is a pain in the ass because it's um, 
uh, it's hardcore. So it's 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 very engaging. There, there's nothing that comes out of the box, and and you just play with it. Um, you have to know what you're doing, and you have to have a reason for doing it. And but it allows you to gain maximum control. Um, Gen2 has uh, near unlimited ad adaptability, and it's multi-platform. So <clears throat> the um, when you're going to choose uh, um, your platform, it supports um, platforms from, from PS3 uh, to phones to, um, I don't know, dozens of, of platforms. It can, pro most likely, yeah, definitely. Um, and um, it doesn't have uh, system constraints. So it can run on on um, on an embedded um, computer with uh, one megabyte of RAM and and four uh, megabytes of flash. So or it can um, make use of the best features of uh, a multi uh, core multi processor uh, server computer um, um, to using the enterprise. Um, it's generally custom built, so when um, th there is no typical Gen2 uh, setup. So whenever you, you encounter a Gen2 system, it's like uh, it's likely that you will not realize it's a Gen2 system until um, it, you um, use the package manager or something that is, is typical of Gen2 system. It provides great control um, because um, because you build it um, uh, specifically uh, for your needs. It doesn't it doesn't come with anything that you are not going to use or that is not required for something that you are going to use. Um, so. Um, and this is not just about the packages; it's about how the packages are constructed. And it has a great community support via its wiki. Um, even when I'm trying to figure out how to, uh, I don't know, configure a mail server on Ubuntu, if if I'm having uh, trouble with with the with the um, um, let's say, the, the man pages in Ubuntu, um, I always go to, uh, to Google and type Gen2, how to, uh, whatever, um, the, the um, mail server software that I'm using. Because I know the, um, the Gen2 wiki will have, just like I'll give you an example for, I don't know, MySQL. Of course, it will have a very specific um, uh, Gen2 uh, ways of installing. But once it's installed, it will have well, this. This particular one is very basic. It just has um, a way to create a basic user and first steps. Normally, it comes with um, a very comprehensive way of Getting started with with a with a minimal in in ways that are really useful, um, without any frills or going into uh, into complexities that you're not going to need. <clears throat> um, and it's always step by step because you're meant to have no idea what you're going to deal with when when you install a package in um, in in one of these how tos and. Uh, from the very steps of how to build it um, until you, you get something useful. Um, you get all the documentation there. The Portage package management is uh, the core of the Gen2 system. Uh, it has a single master rep repository somewhere. That is, um, there, are, there are many, um, it's uh, replicated. Uh, um, um, around the world by many servers, 
um, but it doesn't have like, uh, for example, um, uh, Canonical's package manager that has several sections and you can activate some and deactivate the others. Um, it's, uh, it's unified. It's, it's like um, um, Perl's package management, there, there, there's just one and for everything and it, everything is in there and if any developer wants to create a new one, has to uh, place it there. Um, there are very um, comprehensive guidelines for creating and uploading um, uh, packages and anyone can do it. The, the whole repository for the package manager is based on um, text files with, um, with basically scripts. Some are shell scripts, some are Python scripts, but they are all scripts that you can um, edit and just play around and lie, see what actually does the installer step by step exactly. So there, is, there are no mysteries like uh, apt-get and suddenly everything is, is there and it calls everything and you have no idea what's going on. You can, you can be in control of every single step that, um, um, that the package manager is going to use. Um, the, the repository update, oops, sorry, is done through rsync. So, so um, everybody has the same repository. It's, it's just a, a, a synchron synchronization of files. There is no uh, funny database structure that can get, get corrupted or anything like that. It's just a directory structure with files. And all the files have the same format and, um, and run in the same way. Um, all the packages that Gen2 provides are source, uh, um, source code. So um, th there is a way to create binary packages. Uh, for example, if you have a company and you have several uh, computers that are intended to have the exact same uh, structure, you can organize one computer to do the main repository for um, um, compiled packages. But because it is a meta distribution, it doesn't distribute uh, binaries. Everything running on your computer um, for the bootstrap that you download and, and starts um, with, with a few core uh, compilers and, and, the, um, and the first kernel, etc., uh, that you can recompile. And it's actually recommended that you do recompile. So absolutely every binary on your computer has been compiled in that computer. This is uh, great for multi-platform. If you're using um, any platform other than um, the, a typical one, like a Raspberry Pi, um, you will have the, uh, pretty much the exact same um, packages available for your Raspberry Pi than anyone can have on, your X on their x86 computer. Um, uh, the, um, if anyone has um, experience with uh, BSD ports from any BSD systems uh, like OpenBSD or even Mac ports, um, it runs in, um, it has a very similar uh, way of running. So all, everything is compiled locally. And somehow it's, um, it's highly optimized or, uh, some people try to compare um, Gen2 with uh, Slackware. Slackware is, um, is, is a bit more hardcore. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, it makes things a lot easier than Slackware package management. Um, now, the whole system is compiled according to your needs, mostly with um, a few settings in a main file called um, the um, make.config uh, make.config in etc folder or etc now is etc portage <coughs> and um, you play with with a few use flags that you can uh, research in in one of the um, Gentoo website uh, which is here 
there is a page specifying all the use flags and what are they for. Um, well, I'll look at it perhaps in the It's going to take a while. Anyway, um, the um, uh, perhaps I can. Well, in this case, um, I'm running my um, a, a virtual ser server uh, for production for many purposes, and um, this is my use flags. It's just just a variable spe specifying a number of keywords. Um, this uh, will specify FPM how I want uh, my PHP to uh, to be optimized for, and um, um, a few, uh, very few. I, I use very few global use flags, um, but um, you can have just a few more that define how your computer will be built. Particularly if you're going to be using for the desktop or the server, because it's very specific, uh, you wouldn't have many. But on your desktop, you would have quite a few, just to ensure that you're building when when. Uh, when you're emerging or, or bringing compiling packages, those packages are built exactly according to your preferences. And everything that is not your preferences is discarded from, from the sources and it's not compiled. Those modules are not added at all. For example, you can have a Gen 2 system that is uh, GNOME only and no KDE applications would work. Um, or vice versa, or you can have very minimalistic X server without any GNOME or, or KDE libraries at all. <clears throat> um, and then you have um, granular per package use flags like I do have here. Um, so just a, a, a few settings per um, uh, per package, so it's very easy to um, to understand what is it that um, you're after with every package. Um, um, the control you can gain by just uh, being able to back up the etc folder or the, or or simply the etc portage folder. Um, it's, it's great because you can rebuild your system exactly as it was on, on, on a computer without having to back up um, anything else. So you, it, the computer will have to spend quite a few hours recompiling everything else, um, but you will have the, the same system without having to back up any, any binaries. Um, that's, that's one of the advantages. The other advantage is because you're forced to do everything manually and conscientiously knowing exactly what is it that you want. Um, um, you, you gain um, n not only a sense of being in control, but you actually um, are in control of, of everything that goes. So nothing unexpected happens. There's no stuff popping up um, that um, you have no idea what to do with it. And it also um, doesn't have any problems with um, incompatibilities between libraries. That's that's a great advantage. Um, the um, the configuration scripts for each package as it's it's compiled checks for everything that is available in the system, and if it's available, it makes use of it. If it's not available, um, it uh, allows you to um, either um, install those packages previously. So, for if I were to um, emerge minus a x, yes, 
because I'm not super user, so I'm going to pretend. Um, it calculates all the dependencies and everything that is already um, in, in the system. I should try something like um, pencil. One of the okay. Here we go. Um, it, it um, the package manager shows all the packages that are going to be installed, and it shows uh, which use flags are going to be used, um, and which flags are not going to be used because they are not uh, configured uh, with a minus at the beginning. So you know um, it's going to, um, all the functionality associated with those flags is is not going to be made available uh, to your system. So um, you can review everything here and um, ensure that um, you're going to get the functionality you require because everything is compiled for your specific processor and without any overhead from stuff that you're not going to use, you're um, almost guaranteed every time to get the maximum um, efficiency for um, Every all the all the packages or software that you install in your system. Um, if there are any incompatibilities or um, um, two packages um, collide because of any reasons, it tells you and you can figure it out with um, a number of strategies from the package manager um, to resolve that. Also, any configuration files that are um, um, that require changes in etc. after installing packages. There is a tool that compares the old one and the new one and um, um, you can decide which uh, configuration settings you want to keep, which configuration settings you want to overwrite with the, with the uh, latest version and so forth. So <clears throat> um, by upgrading your system uh, you know that your system is safe. It's not gonna is is it's not gonna get trashed with uh, with new features, and it's not going to um, um, start working in a, in a clunky way because of um, your configuration files not being suitable for the new um, uh, for the new features. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much it. It's great fun to start playing with. Um, with a Gen2 um, system on a virtual machine, um, starting from from scratch, and everything is on uh, command line, and um, and it's quite mesmerizing seeing everything compiling, and knowing that everything that is running on your computer has been created by your computer, um, and um, that is exactly as you intended. Do you have any questions? Have you used Fun2? Hmm? Fun2? Fun2? Yep. The, not yet. Not yet. Uh -huh. I saw it uh, today. It's it's um, uh, a small. Um, well, it's created by the founder of Facebook. Yep. And it's been like uh, well for years. Ah, uh, uh, well, th th this is something I can uh, comment about. There are many distributions that are based on Gen2, such as Puppy, Fun2. Um, uh, dozens, many, many, because being a meta distribution, it really, it's it's really easy um, to define the characteristics and properties of uh, of a particular setup and create that setup as a uh, distro, and then uh, allow to distribute binaries. Uh huh. <laughs> Uh huh. Okay. One one of the things that Gen two um, 
intended to ensure from, from the be very beginning was that it's a, a Gen2 based system is um, entirely free um, as, as uh, in speech and as in beer and there is no proprietary uh, packages in, in the library because everything is, um, well, re 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 it, uh, sources are required to uh, be built. There, there are no binaries. How does You, it doesn't come with anything. You just um, you just emerge. You bring um, that setup. What was the biggest installation of Gen two machines you've seen? Um, Do you think it is just full up for a desktop, or it can be used on the enterprise as well? Ah, it definitely can be used on the enterprise. So how many machines have you seen? I, I haven't seen uh, personally. I've only uh, um, I haven't been involved in in enterprise implementations, and normally because managers are not um, well, it it has to be a very special kind of so company. So what is the biggest you've seen? Hmm? What is the biggest? No, no. I I don't have much more experience than one. my own my own That's experience. Important. Yeah, no, I haven't seen it installed um, anywhere else as a, and I don't think it's very popular on the enterprise. And in Portage development, if there are changes to Portage, right? And there are replacements to Portage. There are replacements? Uh, to the package management system? There has the been um, recently yep. some. So it, it used to be based on Python, and now it's based on, um, it, it has, um, it's no longer just a script to uh, to speed it up. Now it's a binary. Um, it's always been. Hmm? Sorry. Binary is an option, or it's always. No, it used to be based on. Um, I think it it was based on Bash at the beginning. Then it was replaced uh, for Python. So for many years, it uh, ran as a script. The whole package management set of <coughs> tools. Run as a package management uh, as, as, a, as a Python script, and uh, now there are a few tools that um, that are compiled so so that they perform a little a little bit quicker. How much of the um, operating system is um, being used by Python scripts? And you, how, how how much is Python involved in the operating system? Uh, just um, as far as I know. Um, it has been the language of choice for the package manager uh, for many years, and Gen2 um, itself is nothing more than the package manager. Um, everything else is um, contributions made by third parties, generally the, the very people that uh, create those uh, software packages that create um, an e-build set of uh, configuration files that can be um, installed in the um, main package, man, pa um, package um, repository of Gen2. <clears throat> um, another great um, feature that Gen2 has is that it allows you to specify um, exactly which version of um, any application you want to you want to install and you have uh, there's usually a history of several years of uh, worth of versions for each one of the um, of the packages available. Um, it allows you to install several versions simultaneously as well, uh, and there there are great ways to to switch from one uh, to the other and. It's it's all environment based, so you can have some applications using a uh, library from an older version, um, and other programs using a, a newer version for the same library. Um, also, on an x86 machine, you can compile, cross compile um, um, entire. Um, Images or installations for for a different um, uh, platform. This is something I used to do for an embedded computer. 
that had um, very little RAM, RAM, and it was mainly uh, for controlling um, petrol dispensing pumps automatically. <clears throat> and um, so we used the Gen2 environment uh, for the server and for for the development, and uh, as a separate um, section, uh, the um, um, an image that was later uh, copied into a flash drive and it could allow this uh, computer to run. And we had actually three different processors for, for this embedded computer. Uh, so three different platforms with different characteristics and it ran really well. I don't have experience with Arch. Oh, yep, go ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, of course not. Yeah. Spanish. Yeah. Just a just to answer the previous question, why I use Gentoo instead of Arch? Arch is based on binary distribution. You have no choice. Uh, so what means binary? It means somebody else compiled all the packages for you. What options were used for those packages? You have no control of. For example, you want to use feature X, Y in a package. But the developer doesn't want to have that option enabled because he does not want to support it. He does not want to, the, any bugs to, re, to be reported about that feature to him. But with Gentoo, you just need to specify it once in the make.com file, and every next update of the software, next compilation will come with that software option enabled. So you can have KVM, Xen, whatever you want. So nobody, nobody at all can restrict what you can actually use what features can you use in the system. No other Linux distribution allows that, not a single one. So Gentoo is the most flexible out of all Linux and Unix distributions. I absolutely recommend it to use. Uh, Arch build service is, in my understanding, it works just for one package, for another package, right? Right, so you can, uh, basically, there is a community uh, which can build their own packages that are not shaped in the main, in the upstream like Arch. So there's a base packages, for example, 7,000 of packages, and there are like everything, and there is everything else, 10,000, 15,000 packages that are not supported by Arch core team. So, and the, there is like a, sp a special service for that, AUR, like um, yogurt, like whatever when you can basically get those packages compiled by somebody else, but they're not fully supported, or you can compile them yourself. So with Gentoo, there's no such issue at all. So better than Gentoo is probably just FreeBSD or whatever, but that's different. I, uh, can, can you help me? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Linux, if you guys want to give you some Linux. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, just help me. But at the same time, I recommend Arch Linux to everybody else who doesn't need that kind of flexibility. Because Arch Linux is the, the easiest Linux distribution to use after Ubuntu. It is the, if you want to understand the system, Arch Linux is the, it's just absolutely the easiest because like Ubuntu, Fedora, Suzy. Honestly, I'm as she said, and I work with Linux full time. I have no idea what's happening in the system. When I come to KDE or GNOME, I'm just like, uh, what? Well. So I don't know what's happening there. Well, I can try that, but I have no understanding. While with uh, Arch Linux, you can just see. It's it's all very basic. You can figure 
what you want to be. It's, it's all text files. So nothing is hidden from you, which makes it simple. So for learning, I recommend Arch Linux. So, and Gento recommend only if you need to have your own compilation options, like for multiple packages, then use Gento. Or you want to compile your own kernels. But my presentation is actually um, is about Red Hat. Uh, Red, um, because professionally, for the past about four years, I've been working exclusively with Red Hat as a full-time sysadmin and consultant. And uh, a month ago, I went to the Red Hat Summit in Boston. And I just wanted to share what I've, what I have seen in there. Just a second. Cool. So but a month ago, there was a summit in uh, Boston uh, where more than 4,000 delegates from around the world came up and just discussed and the future, what is happening with Red Hat. Does everybody know what Red Hat is? Everybody does, yeah? So it is the biggest open source company uh, that has last year have crossed one billion revenue mark, one billion dollars revenue. It is number one committer to OpenStack, number one committer to Linux kernel, and uh, it is the Many people would say, and I would agree with them, that with them that Red Hat is the Linux in a way. So it is number one enterprise distribution, and it is having the platform in a way. What distinguishes it from FreeBSD, Arch Linux, Gentoo, anybody else? Uh, I do not represent Red Hat. I never worked for Red Hat, but I'm a Red Hat certified engineer. It's kind of, I've worked with Red Hat, but I do not represent them. So this is uh, what I mentioned are uh, contributions of the Red Hat to the Linux kernel. So you see Red Hat is number one, fo followed by Intel, Novell, IBM, and there is even Microsoft on the list, number 21, contributed to the Linux kernel, which might be a shock to someone. But that contribution is primarily to the Hyper-V virtualization, because uh, so that to enable Linux run as a guest, on a virtualized Hyper-V system, which are Windows 2008 server and above. Uh, but Red Hat is not just Linux. It also is uh, middleware, JBoss, OpenShift, OpenStack, Satellite. Does everybody know what these components are? Should I? Do you want to know? Yeah, you, do. you do. OK. Well, middleware is, is basically uh, uh, is like Apache, but for running uh, basically uh, Java applications. So this is JBoss, this is middleware. Um, Enterprise Linux, you know what it is? Record storage. This is a distributed storage like LustreFS that allows you storing basically petabytes of data distributed globally with multiple um, uh, Failover, well, so basically no data will be lost even like one of the replicas goes down, two replicas goes down. So you can configure everything. Red Hat Satellite is a system for managing uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linuxes, the Linuxes. So it allows you to easily uh, see what package, uh, what systems are up to date, perform certain actions on the systems like push updates to them, push configuration changes. So it allows like management of hundreds of thousands of machines. And this is the difference what uh, di differ differentiates Red Hat from Ubuntu and uh, Gentoo, any other distribution. Because Red Hat is focused on enterprise, and enterprise is basically is about thousands of systems. So Red Hat uh, is, makes it easy to scale and to manage thousands of systems. While if you use things like Gentoo, Ubuntu, it, I think it, it will be hard to scale up. For example, I ask this question, how would you manage like 10 machines to? By the way, Gento allows not only source compilation of the machine, it allows also binary packaging. And another thing about Gento, uh, there are distributions that make Gento easier. For example, Calculate Linux allows it to run as a server quite easily. I think it's binary in a way. 
And Sabayon Linux is amazing desktop distribution. Amazing. It was the first one on which I experienced uh, the Compi's effects of like 3D or all, all this stuff. It wasn't gentle. Um, record visualization is uh, is a platform like v VMware, vSphere. So it allows visualizing like hundreds of virtual machines on, on, on the cluster of physical machines. ATMs use Windows, primarily. <laughs> Windows 98. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, or like uh, even uh, what's what was that IBM product of 1993, 94? Oh, yeah, okay. What was that? Oh, Warp, Warp OS 2. So many uh, ATMs run OS 2, okay. or like basically uh, <laughs> or Windows 98. I'm, I'm not. I'm not kidding. If you look at the at the at the failures on the screen, you will see. But, uh, for example, yeah, the biggest, basically, all the, most of the websites, well, I would say on the internet, run probably, well, I wouldn't say most, okay, because Google doesn't, right? But many big uh, companies, like, for example, News Limited, Fairfax, uh, they all run on uh, Red Hat. Uh, so, like, news.com, you, everything runs around. Um, stock exchanges, like, New York Stock Exchange, London Stock Exchange, uh, Australian uh, Stock Exchange. Don't run. Yes, yes. So basically, I can. So it, it happened a few years ago. Basically, Oracle didn't have any Linux distribution. It relied completely on uh, Red Hat. But then probably there were some collisions, whatever, and Oracle maybe wanted to support basically everything from ground up. They have their own hardware. There is their vision. They have the, they wanted to have their operating system, database, everything. They supply you the whole rack. It's like basically the Oracle's idea is to sell iPads, enterprise iPads, where everything, software and hardware are tightly integrated. It's a nice idea. So when you don't need sysadmins, you don't need people, you don't need like Gen2, no, those like hackerish. You don't. Maybe. Why would you need them, right? It's, so it's basically the same as like iPad again. You do not have root privileges on an iPad, or even on an Android phone. If you buy it, you don't. So, but it works. Real estate is moving to Red Hat as well. They were your Debian shop. Now they're like moving to uh, moving to Red Hat. Basically everything. Yeah, all the UTS uh, yep. So the good things about Red Hat is if you have a kernel bug, for example, if you have a kernel bug, you can submit a bug, basically a support case, and it will fix it for you. So I had like I had some. Well, my, my friends, my colleagues had kernel bugs fixed for them. I, just for me, they made modifications to the Apache web server, to the satellite server, to the documentation, some other things. So basically, I submit a support case saying, OK, for example, uh, I need this feature. I want this, which Apache doesn't have, for example, right? And they make sure that it, it will be there in the next release. Or even they will backport some things for me. So for this, it is good. Sometimes people encounter, bu well, organizations encounter bugs in the kernel, weird bugs. And uh, I know of the cases when Debian for, would refuse basically to fix them, like Debian project, because, well, it doesn't affect most of their users, it's just like, percentage. It's not in my interest. I'm going to say, sorry. And people have to support their own versions of kernel, which is, a, which is not a good way to go. So coming to the Red Hat Summit. So event, is, it is an annual event. Uh, basically, it's about June, April. It goes for one week. Uh, it's normally two days of training. 
and three days of the summit. Normally, it has always been in Boston, but next, next year it is San Francisco. Um, so the people that I met there were like from Brazil, Spain, Germany, Australia, Colombia, Austria, from all over the world. In terms of the power training, I did a two days of OpenStack training. So if anybody has OpenStack training questions, come up to me. But there are also available training for troubleshooting, record storage, ABOS, tuning. Uh, there were a number of hands-on labs. Um, as you see the topics. An interesting one is actually the FreeAPA one. FreeAPA is identity management system, the new one, which is basically uh, analog of Active Directory. And it's like the way it was 20 years ago, right? So it's like at that early age of 1990, whatever, five. But it allows, it's an integration of Kerberos, LDAP. Um, basically, it allows uh, and DNS. It allows it to integrate. So one person logs in in one place with, a, for example, SSH key, and then they have access to all the organization, to all the machines that they need to have access to, or that they are allowed to have access to. So you do not, no, you no longer need to distribute SSH keys to every single machine. You don't need that. So you submit your public SSH key just once, and then you're authenticated in the whole organization. Uh, that's free IPA. I'll, uh, I think there'll be another slide on this. One of the exciting things is, does anybody use Red Hat Satellite? Nobody does. OK, it's not exciting, then. <laughs> OK. Uh, basically, they have completely redone their product. We have, that I mentioned is for the management of multiple systems. That will also be allowing management of the release cycle of the software. Uh, this is a uh, life cycle for the, for the record enterprise Linux. So this is what differentiates, for example, enterprise Linux from other normal Linux. Ubuntu, Fedora, they support like their distributions for one year. Well, Ubuntu probably, how many years? Uh, is longer. Three, four years, Three, four years right? <laughs> but in the enterprise, sometimes you have like machines that would be like seven years ago that are still running eight years ago that are still running, whatever. So uh, Rail, uh, Red Hat supports that systems like for 10 to 13 years. So that means any, if they released, for example, Firefox as part of their distribution, and 10 years later, there is some security bug in that Firefox, they'll fix it. So that is why people are paying money for them to them. Um, so RHEL, RHEL 7, RHEL is Record Enterprise Linux. So the seventh version was due to be released this year, actually in June, but it wasn't. It was delayed. And it will be released like better, I think, in December. And then February, but February, there'll be a production version. OK. Uh, uh, new things about it is uh, initialization scheme will be systemd, which will replace the current Ubuntu upstart, which is used in RHEL 6. They use Ubuntu upstart. Uh, MySQL uh, will be replaced with MariaDB by default. So if you yeah. So if you are saying install MySQL, it will install Mar MariaDB. In Fedora, I, it's, I used Fedora 19 and went to use MySQL. All the command, all my SQL commands were actually alias to Maria. Yes. Tools. So I still treated it for yes. the same yes. procedure as I would with MySQL, but in the response you could see that it was actually using Maria DB with yeah. Rail. Rail, Rail is based on Fedora. Yeah. And it's normally based on the latest Fedora before the main release. So for example, Rail 7 will be based on uh, Fedora 19, which was released on the 2nd of July. So then these are some of the packages. So they're adding a no SQL database, MongoDB, Node.js, Maven 3, updating uh, languages. 